Hi there, I'm Heather Ordover, the host of Craftlit. Off and on over the last 17 years, I have brought you the 12 days of Craftlit at Christmas time, something to listen to that you can use to bring back the reason for the season, food, family, friends, and of course, frantic crafting of gifts. This year's a little different because if you're watching this on YouTube, you are in fact watching me on YouTube, but I'm not bringing this to you alone. Craftlit's producer, Eric, has made this possible without him. Long COVID would have stopped the podcast months ago. But this year, several of our stories, very excited announcement, have been suggested or written by Craftlit listeners. I like that. In a very small way, this brings back what the internet was when Craftlit first started. It was a big place full of ideas being shared for free before procasts and marketing money casts sucked the life out of the ether in the landscape and commodified yet another part of our life. Bitter? No, but I am happy to say this is brought to you with no advertisements, no sponsors, just a collection of awesome people who keep the show alive and have done so for 17 and a half years. So our first Christmas story for the 12 Days of Craftlet will be from Jerome K. Jerome. His full name was Jerome Klapka Jerome, but the Klapka thing is a story to itself and also very funny, just like most everything that Jerome K. Jerome did. He is perhaps best known as the author of Three Men in a Boat, to say nothing of the dog. It is one of the great comic masterpieces of the English language ever. It went on to inspire generations of humorists and writers, in particular Monty Python, and Douglas Adams. You can see paths firmly forged between Jerome K. Jerome and those more modern funny people. He was born in Staffordshire, England. On the 2nd of May, 1859, he was the youngest of four children and he was a bit of a whoopsie in lots of ways. He left school at the ripe old age of 14 and he worked a bunch of different jobs. He was a clerk. He was a hack journalist, hack being his description, not mine. Uh, he was an actor, a traveling actor, and he was known to have said, I have played every part in Hamlet except Ophelia, which is kind of impressive because he could have done that too. He was pretty. He was also a schoolmaster, but very much not Ichabod Crane. His first book was called On the Stage and Off, and it was a story about those traveling theater times that he had. It was published in 1885 and was pretty rapidly followed by a bunch more plays and articles that got picked up in magazines. He did very well in 1886 by Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fellow. This is another, as you can tell from the title, very funny story. Readers really loved his sense of whimsy and you will be surprised by the informality of his language. It was popular even back then because of that informality, at least with readers. Critics were kind of weird. Uh, in the preface to Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fellow, he said, this is Jerome K. Jerome, what readers ask nowadays in a book is that it should improve, instruct, and elevate. This book would elevate a cow. So yeah, the Victorians had kind of no idea what to do with this guy, and they certainly had no idea what to do with his, his prose writing. He said, I think that I may claim to have been, for the first 20 years of my career, the best abused author in all of England. He goes on to say, the standard spoke of me as a menace to English letters, and the Morning Post said he was an example of the sad results to be expected from the over-education of the lower orders. Ah, right? Well, it didn't do anything to hurt his sales because Three Men in a Boat, to say nothing of the dog, came out in 1889. And in the 20 years that followed that, Three Men in a Boat had sold, already sold, over 200,000 copies in the UK and over a million in America. Though, as the United States really didn't have any copyright laws to speak of at the time, Dickens got screwed by this too. Jerome K. Jerome received nothing in royalties from those American sales, which really explains a little bit why copyright matters and why writers these days are getting very nervous again. But his publisher, J.W. Aerosmith, said he sold so many copies per annum 
that he thought that the public must be eating these copies of the books. To date, Three Men in a Boat to Say Nothing of the Dog has been translated into almost every language in the world. That's including Esperanto, Pittman's shorthand, Hebrew, Afrikaans, and Sinhalese, just to name a few. It goes on from there. So with this one book, Jerome assured himself of an income for life. He found respectability and security, and 30 years of poverty and struggle were over for him. Some of his friends in the literary world included H.G. Wells, Richard Kipling, Mark Twain, J.M. Barry, and George Barnard Shaw. In 1891, Tales Told After Supper, our story, the one that we are starting the 12 Days of Craplet off with for days one and two, it comes to as part of the long tradition of English ghost stories that surround Christmas. A Christmas Carol is just the most famous. There are tons of English Christmas ghost stories. While Jerome K. Jerome died in 1927 at the ripe old age of 68, he did not die in poverty. And I think his parents would have been surprised by that. Happy, but surprised. So without any further ado, which apparently is what everybody says on YouTube these days, I would like to hand you over to the comic stylings of Ruth Golding. Tales Told After Supper. Buckle in. We've got the first two parts today, second two parts tomorrow. Here we go. Section 1 of Told After Supper by Jerome K. Jerome. Introductory. It was Christmas Eve. I begin this way because it is the proper, orthodox, respectable way to begin and I have been brought up in a proper, orthodox, respectable way, and taught to always do the proper, orthodox, respectable thing, and the habit clings to me. Of course, as a mere matter of information, it is quite unnecessary to mention the date at all. The experienced reader knows it was Christmas Eve without my telling him. It always is Christmas Eve in a ghost story. Christmas Eve is the ghost's great gala night. On Christmas Eve they hold their annual fete. On Christmas Eve everybody in Ghostland who is anybody, or rather, speaking of ghosts, one should say, I suppose, every nobody who is any nobody, comes out to show himself or herself, to see and to be seen to promenade about and display their winding-sheets and grave-clothes to each other, to criticise one another's style, and sneer at one another's complexion. Christmas Eve Parade, as I expect they themselves term it, is a function doubtless eagerly prepared for and looked forward to throughout Ghostland, especially the swagger set, such as the murdered barons, the crime-stained countesses, and the earls who came over with the conqueror and assassinated their relatives and died raving mad. Hollow moans and fiendish grins are, one may be sure, energetically practised up. Blood-curdling shrieks and marrow-freezing gestures are probably rehearsed for weeks beforehand. Rusty chains and gory daggers are overhauled and put into good working order, and sheets and shrouds, laid carefully by from the previous year's show, are taken down and shaken out and mended and aired. Oh, it is a stirring night in Ghostland, the night of December the 24th. Ghosts never come out on Christmas night itself, you may have noticed. Christmas Eve, we suspect, has been too much for them. They are not used to excitement. For about a week after Christmas Eve, the gentlemen ghosts, no doubt, feel as if they were all head, and go about making solemn resolutions to themselves that they will stop in next Christmas Eve, while lady spectres are contradictory and snappish, and liable to burst into tears and leave the room hurriedly on being spoken to, 
for no perceptible cause whatever. Ghosts with no position to maintain, mere middle-class ghosts, occasionally, I believe, do a little haunting on off-nights, on All Hallows' Eve and at Midsummer, and some will even run up for a mere local event to celebrate, for instance, the anniversary of the hanging of somebody's grandfather, or to prophesy a misfortune. He does love prophesying a misfortune, does the average British ghost. Send him out to prognosticate trouble to somebody, and he is happy. Let him force his way into a peaceful home, and turn the whole house upside down by foretelling a funeral, or predicting a bankruptcy, or hinting at a coming disgrace, or some other terrible disaster about which nobody in their senses want to know sooner than they can possibly help, and the prior knowledge of which can serve no useful purpose whatsoever and he feels that he is combining duty with pleasure. He would never forgive himself if anybody in his family had a trouble and he had not been there for a couple of months beforehand, doing silly tricks on the lawn or balancing himself on somebody's bedrail. Then there are besides the very young or very conscientious ghosts with a lost will or an undiscovered number weighing heavy on their minds who will haunt steadily all the year round. And also the fussy ghost, who is indignant at having been buried in the dustbin or in the village pond, and who never gives the parish a single night's quiet until somebody has paid for a first-class funeral for him. But these are the exceptions. As I have said, the average orthodox ghost does his one turn a year on Christmas Eve and is satisfied. Why on Christmas Eve, of all nights in the year, I never could myself understand. It is invariably one of the most dismal of nights to be out in, cold, muddy, and wet. And besides, at Christmas time, everybody has quite enough to put up with, in the way of a house full of living relations, without wanting the ghosts of any dead ones mooning about the place, I am sure. There must be something ghostly in the air of Christmas something about the close, muggy atmosphere that draws up the ghosts, like the dampness of the summer rains brings out the frogs and snails. And not only do the ghosts themselves always walk on Christmas Eve, but live people always sit and talk about them on Christmas Eve. Whenever five or six English-speaking people meet round a fire on Christmas Eve, they start telling each other ghost stories. Nothing satisfies us on Christmas Eve but to hear each other tell authentic anecdotes about spectres. It is a genial, festive season, and we love to muse upon graves, and dead bodies, and murders, and blood. There is a good deal of similarity about our ghostly experiences. But this, of course, is not our fault, but the fault of ghosts who never will try any new performances, but always will keep steadily to old, safe business. The consequence is that, when you have been at one Christmas Eve party, and heard six people relate their adventures with spirits, you do not require to hear any more ghost stories. To listen to any further ghost stories after that would be like sitting out two farcical comedies or taking in two comic journals, the repetition would become wearisome. There is always the young man who was, one year, spending the Christmas at a country house, and on Christmas Eve they put him to sleep in the west wing. Then, in the middle of the night, the room door quietly opens, and somebody, generally a lady in her nightdress, walks slowly in, and comes and sits on the bed. The young man thinks it must be one of the visitors, or some relative of the family, though he does not remember having previously seen her, who, unable to go to sleep, and feeling lonesome all by herself, has come into his room for a chat. He has no idea it is a ghost. He is so unsuspicious. She does not speak, however, and when he looks again— She's gone. 
the young man relates the circumstance at the breakfast-table next morning, and asks each of the ladies present if it were she who was his visitor. But they all assure him that it was not, and the host, who has grown deadly pale, begs him to say no more about the matter, which strikes the young man as a singularly strange request. After breakfast the host takes the young man into a corner, and explains to him that what he saw was the ghost of a lady who had been murdered in that very bed, or who had murdered somebody else there, it does not really matter which. You can be a ghost by murdering somebody else, or by being murdered yourself, whichever you prefer. The murdered ghost is perhaps the more popular but on the other hand you can frighten people better if you are the murdered one, because then you can show your wounds, and do groans. Then there is the sceptical guest. It is always the guest who gets let in for this sort of thing, by the by. A ghost never thinks much of his own family. It is the guest he likes to haunt, who, after listening to the host's ghost story on Christmas Eve, laughs at it and says that he does not believe there are such things as ghosts at all, and that he will sleep in the haunted chamber that very night, if they will let him. Everybody urges him not to be reckless, but he persists in his foolhardiness, and goes up to the yellow chamber, or whatever colour the haunted room may be, with a light heart and a candle, and wishes them all good night, and shuts the door. Next morning he has got snow-white hair. He does not tell anybody what he has seen. It is too awful. There is also the plucky guest who sees a ghost and knows it is a ghost, and watches it as it comes into the room and disappears through the wainscot, after which, as the ghost does not seem to be coming back, and there is nothing consequently to be gained by stopping awake, he goes to sleep. He does not mention having seen the ghost to anybody, for fear of frightening them. Some people are so nervous about ghosts, but determines to wait for the next night, and see if the apparition appears again. It does appear again, and this time he gets out of bed, dresses himself and does his hair, and follows it, and then discovers a secret passage leading from the bedroom down into the beer-cellar, a passage which, no doubt, was not unfrequently made use of in the bad old days of yore. After him comes the young man, who woke up with a strange sensation in the middle of the night, and found his rich bachelor uncle standing by his bedside. The rich uncle smiled a weird sort of smile, and vanished. The young man immediately got up and looked at his watch. It had stopped at half-past four, he having forgotten to wind it. He made inquiries the next day, and found that, strangely enough, his rich uncle, whose only nephew he was, had married a widow with eleven children at exactly a quarter to twelve only two days ago. The young man does not attempt to explain the circumstance. All he does is to vouch for the truth of his narrative. And to mention another case, there is the gentleman who is returning home late at night from a Freemason's dinner, and who, noticing a light issuing from a ruined abbey, creeps up and looks through the keyhole. He sees the ghost of a grey sister kissing the ghost of a brown monk, and is so inexpressibly shocked and frightened that he faints on the spot, and is discovered there the next morning lying in a heap against the door, still speechless and with his faithful latch-key clasped tightly in his hand. All these things happen on Christmas Eve. They are all told of on Christmas Eve. For ghost stories to be told on any other evening than the evening of the 24th of December would be impossible in English society as at present regulated. Therefore, in introducing the sad but authentic ghost stories that follow hereafter, I feel that it is unnecessary to inform the student of Anglo-Saxon literature that the date on which they were told, and on which the incidents took place, was Christmas Eve. Nevertheless, I do so.
End of section one. Section two. How the stories came to be told. It was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve at my Uncle John's Christmas Eve. There is too much Christmas Eve about this book. I can see that myself. It is beginning to get monotonous even to me, but I don't see how to avoid it now. At number 47, Laburnum Grove, Tooting. Christmas Eve in the dimly lighted, there was a gas strike on, front parlour, where the flickering firelight threw strange shadows on the highly coloured wallpaper, while without, in the wild street, the storm raged pitilessly, and the wind, like some unquiet spirit, flew moaning across the square, and passed wailing with a troubled cry round by the milk-shop. We had had supper, and were sitting round talking and smoking. We had had a very good supper, a very good supper indeed. Unpleasantness has occurred since in our family in connection with this party. Rumours have been put about in our family concerning the matter generally, but more particularly concerning my own share in it and remarks have been passed which have not so much surprised me, because I know what our family are, but which have pained me very much. As for my Aunt Maria, I do not know when I shall care to see her again. I should have thought Aunt Maria might have known me better. But although injustice, gross injustice, as I shall explain later on, has been done to myself, that shall not deter me from doing justice to others, even to those who have made unfeeling insinuations. I will do justice to Aunt Maria's hot veal pasties and toasted lobsters, followed by her own special make of cheesecakes, warm, there is no sense to my thinking in cold cheesecakes, you lose half the flavour, and washed down by Uncle John's own particular old ale and acknowledge that they were most tasty. I did justice to them then. Aunt Maria herself could not but admit that. After supper, Uncle brewed some whisky punch. I did justice to that also. Uncle John himself said so. He said he was glad to notice that I liked it. Aunt went to bed soon after supper leaving the local curate, old Dr. Scrubbles, Mr. Samuel Coombs, our member of the county council, Teddy Biffles, and myself, to keep Uncle company. We agreed that it was too early to give in for some time yet, so Uncle brewed another bowl of punch, and I think we all did justice to that, at least I know I did. It is a passion with me, is the desire to do justice. We sat up for a long while, and the doctor brewed some gin-punch later on for a change, though I could not taste much difference myself. But it was all good, and we were very happy. Everybody was so kind. Uncle John told us a very funny story in the course of the evening. Oh, it was a funny story! I forget what it was about now, but I know it amused me very much at the time. I do not think I ever laughed so much in all my life. It is strange that I cannot recollect that story, too, because he told it us four times, and it was entirely our own fault that he did not tell it us a fifth. After that the doctor sang a very clever song, in the course of which he imitated all the different animals in a farmyard. He did mix them a bit. He brayed for the bantam-cock and crowed for the pig, but we knew what he meant all right. I started relating a most interesting anecdote, but was somewhat surprised to observe, as I went on, that nobody was paying the slightest attention to me whatever. I thought this rather rude of them at first, until it dawned upon me that I was talking to myself all the time instead of out aloud so that, of course, they did not know that I was telling them a tale at all, and were probably puzzled to understand the meaning of my animated expression and eloquent gestures. 
It was a most curious mistake for any one to make. I never knew such a thing happen to me before. Later on our curate did tricks with cards. He asked us if we had ever seen a game called the three-card trick. He said it was an artifice by means of which low, unscrupulous men, frequenters of race-meetings and such-like haunts, swindled foolish young fellows out of their money. He said it was a very simple trick to do. It all depended on the quickness of the hand. It was the quickness of the hand deceived the eye. He said he would show us the imposture, so that we might be warned against it, and not be taken in by it and he fetched uncle's pack of cards from the tea-caddy, and, selecting three cards from the pack, two plain cards and one picture-card, sat down on the hearth-rug, and explained to us what he was going to do. He said, "'Now I shall take these three cards in my hand, so, and let you all see them, and then I shall quietly lay them down on the rug, with the backs uppermost, and ask you to pick out the picture-card, and you'll think you'll know which one it is. And he did it. Old Mr. Coombs, who is also one of our church-wardens, said it was the middle card. "'You fancy you saw it?' said our curate, smiling. "'I don't fancy anything at all about it,' replied Mr. Coombs. "'I tell you, it's the middle card. I'll bet you half a dollar it's the middle card.' "'There you are. That's just what I was explaining to you,' said our curate, turning to the rest of us. "'That's the way these foolish young fellows that I was speaking of are lured on to lose their money. They make sure they know the card. They fancy they saw it. They don't grasp the idea that it is the quickness of the hand that has deceived their eye.' He said he had known young men go off to a boat-race or a cricket-match with pounds in their pocket, and come home early in the afternoon stone broke, having lost all their money at this demoralising game. He said he should take Mr. Coombs's half-crown, because it would teach Mr. Coombs a very useful lesson, and probably be the means of saving Mr. Coombs's money in the future, and he should give the two and sixpence to the blanket fund. "'Don't you worry about that,' retorted old Mr. Coombs. "'Don't you take the half-crown out of the blanket fund, that's all.' And he put his money on the middle card, and turned it up. Sure enough, it really was the Queen. We were all very much surprised, especially the curate. He said that it did sometimes happen that way, though that a man did sometimes lay on the right card by accident. Our curate said it was, however, the most unfortunate thing a man could do for himself, if he only knew it, because when a man tried and won, it gave him a taste for the so-called sport, and it lured him on into risking again and again, until he had to retire from the contest a broken and ruined man. Then he did the trick again. Mr. Coombs said it was the card next the coal-scuttle this time, and wanted to put five shillings on it. We laughed at him and tried to persuade him against it. He would listen to no advice, however, but insisted on plunging. Our curate said very well, then. He had warned him, and that was all that he could do. If he, Mr. Coombs, was determined to make a fool of himself, he— Mr. Coombs must do so. Our curate said he should take the five shillings, and that would put things right again with the blanket fund. So Mr. Coombs put two half-crowns on the card next the coal-scuttle, and turned it up. Sure enough, it was the Queen again. After that, Uncle John had a florin on, and he won and then we all played at it, and we all won. All except the curate, that is. He had a very bad quarter of an hour. I never knew a man have such hard luck at cards. He lost every time. We had some more punch after that, and Uncle made such a funny mistake in brewing it, he left out the whiskey. Oh, we did laugh at him, 
and we made him put in double quantity afterwards as a forfeit. Oh, we did have such fun that evening. And then, somehow or other, we must have got on to ghosts, because the next recollection I have is that we were telling ghost stories to each other. End of section two. Recording by Ruth Golding. I hope you enjoyed our start of Jerome K. Jerome's Tales Told After Supper. There is more hilarity to ensue tomorrow. This is really just the ramp up to the rest of the fun. If you enjoyed what you listened to, please think about liking if you are watching this on YouTube. If you are listening elsewhere, wherever you get podcasts, please consider both moseying over to YouTube and subscribing to the channel there as well as subscribing via iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Craftlet's been going for 17 and a half years, and it is only because of you that we're able to keep going at all, period. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you're laughing.